right. Today, we're in Matthew chapter 15. And uh, if you would like to turn to Matthew chapter 15, we'll be in verses 29 to 38. And so uh, if you want to uh, get your Bibles opened up to that or turn your phone on or whatever you're going to do, uh, Matthew 15, 29 to the end. And uh, we're going to be starting right here in 29. Let me read that for us. It says, Jesus went on from there and walked beside the Sea of Galilee. And he went up on the mountain and sat down there. And great crowds came to him, bringing with them the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others. And they put them at his feet, and he healed them. So the crowd wondered when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled healthy, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. Let's pray. Father, we ask this morning that you would make your word come alive to us, that you would make it live in us, that as we hear your word read, as we look at what it says to us, Father, fill our hearts with your word. Help us to meditate on it. Help us to think about it. Allow it to change us and cause us to become the people you have called us to be. We ask all this in the name of our Savior Jesus. Amen. So last week we saw that Jesus has moved uh, to uh, the Gentile area. He's in, he was in Tyre and Sidon last week. And now Matthew tells us he's moved closer to the shoreline of the uh, Sea of Galilee. And uh, we're going to see a similar story today to what we saw in chapter 14, but it's different, so I don't want to just brush over it too quickly. This area that Jesus is in is in the area that's lived in by the Gentiles predominantly. And uh, we see Jesus coming here, and he gets to the seashore, and he goes up onto the mountain, the, the hillside next to it, and he sits down. Not because he's tired, but in this day, the teacher sat down to teach. And so he comes up on this hillside, and he sits down to teach the people. And the people who see him and recognize him and know who he is, they begin to bring to him everyone who needs healing. And they begin to lay him down there. I was reading a commentary, and the word for for Put, placing him is actually tossing, like throwing them down. And I don't really think that that's what they were doing, you know. Here, take care of this. But in reality, they were laying him or laying them or placing them before Jesus to be healed. And I thought about this. You can imagine what this must have been like. This wasn't a hospital waiting room. There weren't nice chairs laid out. There wasn't a coffee urn over there where you could get some coffee and, and sit and wait for the doctor. This was more, in my mind, like a festival or uh, maybe the, the, the county fair where people were just coming and kind of milling around and, and they would come there and they would look for the teacher who they had heard was there and they would seek him out and they would place their loved ones at his feet waiting to be healed. This wasn't a comfortable environment, but this was the place where people were coming to because they wanted to see Jesus, because they wanted something from him. And so it kind of reminded me as I was reading through it in Moses, when, when you, if you remember, in Exodus 18, Moses is um, judging the people. And what he was doing was he was trying to settle disputes between the people of Israel. And they would come to him and ask him what way the, the judgment would go. Am I right or are they right? What should we do? And it says there that they came from morning until night. And he spent all day sitting there listening to the problems of the people and resolving them. And this gave me the same sense that Jesus is sitting down here and the people just come to him. And they're laying their problems at his feet. And they're just saying, here it is. Take care of this. Here's my need. I need this taken care of. And you can imagine Jesus going through this whole time and, and the um, time that it's 
took from him, the energy it took from him, the, the uh, um, tiredness that he may have felt as he's going through this. And Matthew gives us a listing of these healings. And this is not just general healings. This is a specific list. It's the same list that Jesus gave to John the Baptist that says, here are the healings that you'll recognize the Messiah by. And so Matthew gives us this same list of healings because he wants to remind us that Jesus is Messiah, that Jesus is the Christ. And so he gives us this same list. And then at the end of this section, it says, and they glorified God in Israel. And that took me back. I started thinking how many times we've read in the Old Testament. And I want to share with you a couple. One is in uh, 1 Samuel. <clears throat> and in, in uh, 1 Samuel uh, chapter 17, verse 46... Let's see here. Okay. So David is getting ready to fight with um, Goliath. And Goliath is taunting Israel. And David says in verse 46, This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head, and I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air, to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. That's his comment. That you will know that there is a God in Israel. And in 1 Kings, uh, chapter 18, verse 36, it says, um, And at that time, the offering uh, of the obligation, Elijah, the prophet. Now, this is Elijah when he's um, battling against the prophets of Baal. And he says, Elijah, the prophet, came near and said, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel. That's a great statement that's being said. And here we see in Matthew that these um, Gentiles who are there seeking out Jesus and finding him are coming and saying, praise God of Israel. And we're seeing the truth that when God acts and performs his miracles, when he moves, the world will know that there is a God in Israel. That there is a God in Israel. And we look at this and we say, we today can say the same thing. There is a God in Northridge Christian Church. There is a God in the people of God. We do not serve idols who cannot see and cannot hear and cannot act. We serve a living God who is the creator of everything and is in control and sovereign over all things. And we want to make sure that we keep that in mind. We are not weak. We are servants of the mighty God. And so here we see the, the people who are living here, who are Gentiles, who are not the chosen people, but they see and understand that there is a God. These people expect to get healed, and they actually get what they want. They get healed. And it's interesting, they're amazed that it doesn't tell us whether they have a heart that recognizes Christ for who he is. It doesn't say that they have a reverence for Christ. We're not really told about that. But we are told that they understand something. They understand that Jesus' power comes from God. And they give God praise and honor. And so it tells us something about them that they at least recognize who Jesus is and where his power comes from. But I wonder if we don't make the same mistake in our lives sometimes. We get what we want, but do we really understand who's in control? 
We shall, uh, we shall um, get the things that God gives us. And we might say, well, thank you, God. But do we stop and think about the fact that it is God who is in control of all things? That it is God who is always worthy of praise and glory, even when he says no or not now. I'm reminded of a story. There was a a father who tells about how God healed his little girl. And afterwards, somebody came up to him and said, oh, God is good. And he made this very uh, important point. He said, God is good. Because God is good, not because he healed my little girl. We don't think that way all the time. We're very quick to thank God when he gives us the things we're looking for, the things that we want. But are we just as quick to thank God when he says, no, not right now? That's a harder time to be thankful, isn't it? When you're waiting for something and you don't get what you want. To stop and say, thank you, God, for being there. In fact, we're going to see as we move along, Jesus is going to tell us that's still too late to say thank you. So let's go on. Uh, In verse 32, it tells us, Then Jesus called his disciples to him, and he said, I have compassion on the crowd, because they've been with me now for three days and have nothing to eat. And I am unwilling to send them away hungry, lest they faint on the way. And the disciples said to him, Where are we going to get enough bread in such a desolate place to feed so great a crowd? And Jesus said to them, How many loaves do you have? And they said, Seven, and a few small fish. And directing the crowd to sit um, down on the ground, he took the seven loaves and the fish And having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied, and they took up seven baskets full of the broken pieces left over. Those who ate were 4,000 men, besides women and children. And after sending away the crowds, he got into the boat, and he went to the region of Magadan. Now, Jesus calls his disciples, and he says, I have compassion on the crowd. Do you recognize that? How many times do we read that about Christ? He had compassion. He didn't have compassion only on the Israelites. He had compassion on people. He had compassion and loved and cared for all the people. He tells them that they've been with him for three days. So for three days, he's been sitting and teaching and healing and being with the people. And he takes responsibility for their welfare. He says, I'm not willing to send them away empty-handed. He takes responsibility, even though it's clear that these people came to him of their own free will. He didn't force anybody to come there. He didn't lead them out into the wilderness and then plan to abandon them. No, he says, they came to me. They're my responsibility now. I'm not willing to send them away. And this group is mostly Gentiles. So these are not the lost sheep of Israel, as we spoke about last week. This is clearly outside of his mission, if his mission was to Israel. And yet, he's showing us his mission to Israel is going to extend also to all nations. And he's going to be responsible for them as well. We remember that we saw that last week, that his mission was to Israel. And he's going to stay on mission to Israel but he's also encountering all these people. And he's saying, they're just as important to me. Their salvation is just as important. So this large crowd has stayed with him. They've been with him for a long time. And Jesus shows his care and he's he's wanting to take care of their need. 
And I was reading this, and it's interesting, and I'm sure you thought of this. Why is it that they, uh, uh, the disciples don't already know what Jesus has up his sleeve? Right? Why is it that they ask that question? That same question that they just asked a few chapters ago, why is it that they don't see this? You, I was thinking, shouldn't they have said, oh, watch, he's going to do it again? But that's not what they say. They look at him and they go, well, how are we going to take care of this whole crowd? It's as if they've never been there before. And you wonder what caused them to do it. So perhaps they're just slow learners. And that's probably true in some part. Just like us, you know, we're not very quick. At least I'm not. I learn things and I've got to learn it again. And sometimes God says, we need to learn this a third time, don't we? Um, we, we go through our life, we're not always quick learners. So maybe they were slow to learn. We know that Jesus is going to continue to teach them and continue to open their eyes to things. We'll see that as we move through Matthew. But you wonder, what is it that causes them to do this? Paul says it's a mystery that is revealed to us that God's intention for salvation was to all the nations. Because originally, the Israelites felt it was only for them. And, and Paul says, no, the mystery that's being revealed is that all nations are going. Now, it's, it's there in the scripture, but Paul says it's a mystery that we don't see until it's shown to us. And so, um, this is perhaps what's happening. Maybe they're just slow to learn on this. Or perhaps they have a different uh, mentality. Perhaps these disciples are still thinking as Jews. They're still thinking as Israelites. They're still saying, nope, this Jesus, this Messiah is for Israel. And you guys don't get to have any part of it. You're not included in Israel, you Gentiles, and therefore we're not going to even think about doing anything for you in the way that we did for the Israelites. And you say, well, that's kind of a a sad thing. But realize who you're dealing with. These are the disciples. These are the men who just a few years ago were walking and living as Jews who were thinking all the things that they had been taught. And they're now being recreated by Christ. They're now being taught these new things from Christ. These things that he wants them to know. And so perhaps they're struggling with this idea that the kingdom is for everyone. And that the kingdom is for everyone. You know, Peter, even on the day of Pentecost, gets up and says that Christ died for everybody. But it's not until he's sitting in Cornelius' house and he sees the flames of fire of the Holy Spirit and he goes, wow, now I get it. He really is for everyone. So we see this change that's going to take place. And so they may still be struggling with this idea. And I wonder whether we don't have that same issue in our own lives. That sometimes we think that even though we want to share the gospel with everyone, we just don't want to share it with that one or with that one. And I wonder whether we struggle with that in our own walk with Christ. And we don't do it because we're being mean or we're holding out but because we just don't think that way. We, be, we need to begin to say, I need to look at everyone the way Christ looked at everyone. I need to see them the way he sees them. I need to have compassion for everyone. Compassion that says, everybody is dying and going to hell unless they know Jesus Christ. And we need to share that with them. Last week, we were reminded that we need to stay on mission all the time. And our mission is to glorify God, just as Jesus' mission was to glorify God. We're called to do what Jesus did, not just to know what Jesus did. 
Juliana and I were in a, a discipling class this week, and the point was made that it's not enough to know what Jesus did, but that we're required, that we're compelled to do what Jesus did, to act upon that. That's a much more difficult thing, right? I can read it in the scriptures and I can see what Jesus did and I can read where it says he had compassion. The question is, will I have compassion in my heart the way he had compassion in his heart? It's not enough to know it. We're called to do the things of Christ. So he asked the disciples what they have. What do you have available? And he prepares the people. He tells them to sit down. It's not just in order to just sit down. It's, an, it's a command to sit down for a meal. He says, hey, guys, sit down. We're going to eat. Right? When dinner is ready, mom says, hey, dinner's ready. Everyone come and sit down. We're not going to have a talk. We're going to fill our gullets. Right? We're going to sit down and have a meal together. That's the call. And Jesus says, hey, everybody sit down. We're going to eat something together. And he, he then takes what he has and he gives thanks to God. Then he divides it and he gives it to the disciples to give to the people. Now, I know if, if you're like me in our house, we sit down, the plates get served, you sit, and then you have a prayer. Jesus says, no. Pray before God acts. Pray in thanks before God does anything. He takes what he has and he gives thanks to God and then he acts. And I wonder if we don't always get that in reverse. When God acts, I'm usually thankful. And I usually say, thank you so much for helping me to get home uh, without a flat tire. Thank you so much for helping me to have enough money to get through the month. Thank you so much for the wonderful provisions you've given me. But do you wake up in the morning and say, thank you, God, for whatever it is you're going to do today? Think about it. Thank you, God, for the fact that I have absolutely no idea what's coming today, but you're sovereign. You're in control, and you will give the opportunity to me to bring glory and honor to you. See, Jesus said thanks to God because he said, I have an opportunity here to glorify you, God, and I'm going to bring glory and honor to your name by doing what you've called me to do. Thank you so much for that. We need to begin to start thinking and thanking God in advance of the things that he hasn't done yet. Knowing that he's sovereign God, that he's almighty, that he will do his will, and we get to be a participant in that. What a great thing to thank him for. And so Jesus is teaching his disciples to thank God before God acts. At this point, you're going to see that this story kind of copies the previous story that we had. But I want us to point out something. Jesus is going to feed these people. He gives thanks to God. He begins to break the bread and he gives it to the disciples. By the sheer numbers, it would seem that the disciples would have had to continue to break the bread and pass it out, wouldn't it? I don't think Jesus waited for 5,000 people to come to him and stand in a food line while he broke the bread off. It tells us he gave it to the disciples and the disciples passed it out. So it would seem that the miracle of the breaking of the bread was still happening in the midst of the disciples' hands. And I think it's interesting that we look at that, we begin to see that Jesus teaches his disciples to do what he does and to let God provide. He gives that to them. They give it on to the people. And so we see that this same thing is beginning to happen. 
And for us in the church, we should look at it the same way. When we're doing what Christ does, he's going to act through us. That God is going to do his will in the midst of our hands, in the midst of our feet. As we go, he will go with us. We're never alone. We're not doing this by ourselves. We're doing the will of God. And he says, go into all the world. Make disciples, baptize them, and teach them everything that I have taught you. He says to go do that. That's what he tells the church. Everything there is set for God to act. The disciples receive the food, they pass it along, and Jesus is showing his disciples this very concept. Paul even writes about it when he writes to the Corinthian church in chapter 11. In verse 23 he says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. What is he saying? I'm doing what I've been taught. Here's what Jesus taught me, now I'm teaching you. That is the whole purpose of of making disciples. It is the whole purpose of going into the world as God's people, to take to the world what Christ has given to us and to share it with them. And we shouldn't be any different than the disciples of Christ. We receive from Jesus salvation and we're expected to pass that on to others. I know we don't save anybody. I'm not trying to suggest that. But Christ gave us the opportunity to know him and to accept him as our savior and be saved. And we're supposed to pass that on to others and to share that with them. And he expects us to do that. We're called to make disciples. So what's a disciple? We were talking this week, we were together, and and we heard a term that I think is really perfect for us. We are apprentices of Christ, and we're called to make apprentices of Christ. Easier word for you to understand? Disciple, God, I don't know what that is. Apprentice, oh, I know what that is. That's a guy who's learning how to do something from somebody else who already knows how to do it. And he's going to learn so he can teach somebody else how to do it. That's a disciple. We'll call him an apprentice. This is the one who is learning. He makes one who makes another who makes another who makes another. If you want a visual, I'll give you this. You take two mirrors, you put them together, and then you peek in from the side and look at it. And what do you see? You see an unlimited number of, of copies of the exact same thing. And the only thing that prevents you from seeing all of them is your ability to look deep enough into the mirror to see it. But all you see is replication after replication after replication. That's what God's calling us to do, to replicate ourselves. To be just like Jesus. We're not Jesus. We're just like him. We're a, a great duplicate. I'm not the original, but I'm a, a, I should be a darn close duplicate of who he is. That's what we're calling to do. Jesus gets into the boat then. He leaves, presumably, with his disciples. And he heads back across the lake to the people of Israel, staying on mission. Still going back to them. He ends his stay here at the, at the Gentile side of the lake. But the mission for the Big C Church is written in Matthew 28. To go into all the world. How that plays out at NCC is that we're all called to grow together into the abundant life of Christ. No matter what we do, this is what we do. It's the first and foremost thing that we should be doing. But I wanted to think about how this functions in our life. In real life, how do you make this happen? So one of the things I want to ask you is, do you make yourself available to others? When you're sitting in the coffee shop, are you looking for an opportunity to be helpful 
or to be kind or to share with somebody? To just say thank you to the person who made your coffee for you? To ask them by name, you ever notice? They all have those name tags on there. So it's not like you don't know their name. How about if you use it sometime and say, hey, Mary, thank you so much for the coffee you made. It's really good. Do we recognize that God is sovereign and all-powerful and everything we have comes from him? Do we think about that? Do we spend our time contemplating that and recognizing it and thanking him for it? Do we have compassion for everyone or just for the people we like? Christ had compassion for everyone. He was sitting with the Gentiles, those who were opposed to the Israelites. Before that, he was sitting with the Pharisees who were opposed to him being the Messiah. And yet he had compassion on everyone. Do we have compassion? Do we see the world the way Jesus sees them? And if not, we need to begin looking differently and seeing it differently. Do we expect God to act only when we want him to? Do we thank him before he does anything? I want you to really think about this week. Thanking God before he does anything. Get up in the morning and say, thank you for whatever is coming today. i got to tell you, that's going to be tough Mondays, right? I hate Mondays. Mondays are always Mondays. It's the, it's the day that everything seems to blow up, and there always seems to be problems. You ever gotten up on a Monday and say, thank you, God, for this Monday. I don't know what's coming, but thank you for it anyhow. Why? Because we get to serve him that day. We get to be an example of him to the world we should get up in the morning and say thank you for the opportunity and lastly do we intend to pass along what we've received from God do we intend every day to get up and find a way to share Christ's goodness with someone else he has loved you with a love you can't imagine he died on the cross He bled for you. He washed you clean. God replaced your sin with his righteousness so that you could spend eternity with God. When you wake up in the morning, say, how am I going to share that great story with somebody today? How am I going to do that? There has to be a way, God. Show me the way. Help me to do it. I was reading this morning and and, uh, um, how the... um, in Acts, when the people, uh, John and, and Peter, were taken before the council, and they were threatened for teaching about Jesus after they had healed the man. And the people come together, and they pray. And you know what they pray for? Boldness to keep teaching about Jesus. They don't pray for God to smite the council. They don't pray for the evil people to be taken out of their lives. They pray to God and say, help us to be bold to talk about Jesus. And that's a prayer that God goes, yeah, that's exactly what I'm looking to do. So I want to encourage us this week. Think about the things that we have from Christ. Think about what God has done. Think about what he's going to do and be thankful for it. And pray to him every day for ways that he can use you in the world to share the gospel with someone. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. I thank you so much because you loved me when I'm completely unlovable. I thank you for taking away my sins. I thank you for making me your child. Father, we thank you because every day we have the opportunity to bring glory and honor to you, to share Jesus with someone, to just live our lives in a way that brings glory to you by being kind and generous and and cheerful around the people in the world who are facing such hardship. Father, I just pray that you will put in our heart 
a boldness to go out and speak the truth of Christ to the world. To not shy away, but to be bold in telling them that you love them so much. I pray that you'd walk with us each and every day. Lift us up and help us to do the things that you've called us to do. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.